Good afternoon, I'm GM Comfortable Gray with the latest version 1.3 update for Daggerheart. I've updated my world. With 1.3, I'd like to show you what I've got going on. And so, with no further ado, please arm yourselves with pens and shield yourselves with graph paper as we gather around the campfire of our collective imaginations. As usual, we're just going to have to log in. By default, there's no password. Although with the version 1.3, they haven't updated the pre-generated characters, I took a liberty of doing so. One thing to note is that these characters don't have everything that an actual character would have, and that's just going to be okay. I did add the secondary weapon to all of them, and we're just going to take this from the opening through the entire quick start adventure, which I also did my best to update for version 1.3. Let's say I wanted to control Barnacle. Assign Barnacle to me. This is very important for my world, is that you need to have a character assigned to you, otherwise the roles aren't going to work properly. Then we can look at Barnacle character sheet. This is entirely pre-made. By going into edit, then you can click and drag any of these items as appropriate when you're making your own character. And that's just going to make it very easy in order to see what you have. And then you're going to do it again for your items themselves. And you'll need to manually update your attributes. Of course, agility, finesse, instinct, knowledge, presence, and strength, as well as level, proficiency, and evasion. I have it updated so that you've got your maximum armor slot of six, maximum hope of six, maximum stress of six, and your armor is reduced because armor is going to be more slots used, but fewer actual armor points per use. And let's just go ahead, let's have Barnacle spar with Garrick, why not? It's going to be using his dagger. I have put macros in, so it's going to automatically roll and compare it to the target's difficulty or evasion, whichever they have, and use an animation. We have our fear die, our hope die, our result, and whatever the difficulty was, and that we used finesse for the dagger. Then I can click here for the damage, it's going to roll the damage. Pretty simple things like that. It uses inspirational words. You can either click on the notepad there in order to see it directly, or when you click it, it's going to use it, and it's also going to put it into the chat. There's the animation for inspirational words. So at the start of the session, we should have put a number of tokens equal to his presence. He has a presence of one, and I would just put this here. Every character is going to have different things they're going to want to put into these as appropriate. Just do what makes sense. It's the easiest way to record them. And so, just like that, he can choose to then use that one, clear a stress, heal that point, gain a hope, or inspirational words. So let's look at Garrick. Garrick has a minor threshold of one, major of eight, so this would have done one damage. So let's say that he takes the one damage, scroll down, I'm going to reassign myself to Garrick, and then this macro is going to work. Then Barnacle would use inspirational words, and we can reduce the hit point and get rid of this one inspiration point, essentially. That's some of the, I'm going to say, drawbacks of the system, is I haven't fully figured out how to automate the armor, the shield, things like that, but a lot of the work is going to be done for you. Where it's not clear, you can right-click on the character, go into the effects here, and assign a status effect. That's going to be useful for when you don't have an animation to help record these things. That's how I'm going to be doing it and how I have done it. And that's the basics of how it's going to work. I'm going to reassign myself to my fear tokens, which is what I will be most of the time. I'm going to be the game master. For character creation, if you're just using the pre-generated, you're going to have people use this mini card bar. And it's going to be pretty useful for seeing everything you need. You're going to click select a hand, and then select a hand. No hand, choose the hand. That's going to say I'm using Barnacle's hand, select it. By default, Barnacle doesn't have any cards, but Barnacle does have a vault. And so I'm going to go to Barnacle's vault. I'm going to draw two cards from Barnacle's vault. And those are going to be his domain cards. To view them, click here. And to make it bigger, you can just use these arrows in the corner to get a better look at them. 
and these are updated for the newest version. And so if they use this, if you only have one presence, you may as well just flip this by right clicking after you've used it. That's one of the better features. Otherwise, I've shown you the basics. Additionally, in order to modify these cards, you're going to need to go to the vault. I suggest you go to the vault, go to whatever you need. Let's say I'm going to put his heritages into here. So his ancestry. These cores aren't available to the players. Only the game master can have them. Then click and drag. It's going to duplicate it that way. You don't need to remove it. And this is how you're going to be creating additional vaults for your characters. You can do that for any of these players and then save it. And then they can draw them as appropriate. Not bad, not hard at all. If they want to have more control, then you can go to the vault in the hand and then drag it over. And it's going to put it as drawn. See, when you go from a deck to a hand that draws it, but if it was going to be hands and hands, then they wouldn't work the same. So this is one of the ways I've modified the system in order to be more accommodating, I feel. I'm also going to be opening up a official campaign for the playtest. Please, if you want to join me on Start Playing, check out the link in the description. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is a premium game. I put a lot of effort into this. And I can say with a lot of sincerity that I love TTRPGs and I think you will find every moment and every experience we generate together valuable. I look forward to seeing you online. And this is where the warning begins. Now here is my warning. I'm going to be going into GM prep for the quick start adventure. And so if you don't want any spoilers, then I suggest you turn off the video here, consider like, commenting, and subscribing, and let me know if you find any errors or glitches in here. I've already found a couple just through this small beta of my beta. So the adventure starts with the merchant cart. I find that it's easiest to drag the horse along rather than the cart. Using the follow me module, I have the cart following the horse pretty simply. And then you can, and only the game masters should see these global notes. A1. This evening, your party finally made it to the Sablewood, a sprawling forest of colossal trees, some say are even older than Forgotten Gods. And so this is going to be the actual scene itself, but in the summary, they're going to give you basically what you can expect for your preparations. Here is an additional warning. You're going to want to know and refer to the actual Quick Start Adventure PDF at any time, because I do make mistakes, and they also tell you about how Marlow Fairwind is supposed to be here. Replace them with one of your characters if you're not using the pre-generated. When they get into the scene, the characters are going to interact with the Strix Wolf Mother. I don't have any tokens for the pups, but the Strix Wolf is going to essentially either attack them or fly away, depending on how they interact with it. Then when that happens, I'm going to hit Alt 2 to change my hockey. Then you're going to have new adversaries arrive. And so you can make the adversaries pop up. three ambushers, and one thief. I don't often put the thief up. They've got a higher difficulty to notice, and they got the little pop right there. That's their summit animation. The thief is going to try to steal the cart, while the ambushers are going to try to defeat the party. My group actually tried to talk their way out of this, and I needed to force the combat. So I spent fear tokens to say this was going to happen. And then you can move the card over. And end up having the thief take the cart and use his power to push enemies away. So what I did is I modified them to be compared to some of the other tier zero, tier one enemies. And rather than spending fear, spend a stress for this. Afterwards, they're going to arrive in hush. Here's an additional caveat. They're going to want to click on this one, and then toggle patrol before you activate it. Some of these move kind of strangely. They go back to their starting points. Make sure you get them started before your party goes there. Otherwise, you're going to see it. It's going to ruin some of their immersion. And that's just nothing can be done about that. Same thing with Sneaking Arcanist. Same thing with the Treehouse itself. And those are the only ones where I have the patrol module used. See the, the Treehouse not flying over there? 
but then it's going to return to a gentle sway on the tree, which I just think is a, a pretty pleasant effect on there. Anyway, back to the arrival in Hush. When they get to Hush, they're going to feel things pop. I see they're, they're coming back and forth, so you're always going to want to do this before your party gets in here. Whether you are coming back, when you're coming back and forth, that's when it's going to be strange. You've got Fidget, Halathon, and Lausa. is a little bit hard to see here. Those are the pre-named NPCs which can now interact with the party. Give them a chance to do so. I modified this description so that once they burst through the wards protecting Hush, then they're going to see the Clover Tavern in this large tree here. After getting good roleplay with these NPCs, one of them or more of them is going to help them get to the tavern. Once they're in the tavern, they get the description where they're going to hang their shoes up on the line. And, you know, maybe they don't wear shoes. We had a furbold, maybe you have a halfling. So the furbold, I decided, we decided, has hooves, even though canonically it's the uh, foam that has hooves, but you can modify it any way you want to. And then from there, I'm using the stairway teleporter module. So I'm just going to bring Barnacle in, our friendly little rivet rogue. And they don't need to be controlled or assigned to the user for this one. Just move them up. You can sit, describe this lift here. And then when they get lifted, it's going to take them to the next part. And so this is what the party's going to see. They see people milling about. There's some type of ritual that people in Hush go through whenever a new person comes to the tavern. And so what I have right, happen right now, people get to decide that there's also going to be a strange aroma, something in the air. And try to pull on those throughout the rest of the story. They continue going in because they're looking for the white fire arcanist. They can get to the very top where these two people, who are the ones who operate the witch, are going to be working. And they or another NPC can reveal that the white fire arcanist must be at their home, in the farms, beyond the farms. And so then we're going to return to the treehouse. Click here. It's probably going to do that funny business again. Oh no, we're lucky. And oh, it does it again. That's where you're going to want to do this before you right click and activate for the party. And once you're good, it should be good on their side. Here, it's swaying, counterweighting on this stone here. And then the party has their option. They can try to call, try to cut the counterweight, or climb the tree. In my case, they tried to climb the tree, and they succeeded, so it was no problem. Once they got on there, you can see faintly here is the white fire arcanist. The I'm just right-clicking the Arcanist, and then I can toggle visibility safe. There they are. The seven-foot-tall mixture of a firefly and a humanoid appears, speaks to them, invites them into the treehouse. In the treehouse, and once you have your player characters, you're going to make sure that their tokens are on all these scenes before you move them, otherwise they won't be able to see. Then they're going to need to produce the package from the carriage they've been moving this entire time. When they get here, just right-click and reveal that... This is the keystone to the gate, a very important part of the ward to their town. You haven't really decided what city this character comes from yet. Maybe you did some world building, maybe you don't. It's up to everybody involved. And that's going to be your opportunity to build some more of a setting and just have fun with it. Then eventually you're going to agree to go to the ward renewal. In this case, I have both the Arcanist and the carriage following the horse. Go through the description. Pull the horse right about there. Have Arcus follow, and Arcus has the glow. Then you can reveal the keystone. Everybody's going to take a short rest. In here, I have the description for what they can do for their short rest. And then it's going to be the combat. Again, use the summon option. It's going to be four skeletons and two wraiths. A little summon animation. And then use this to adjust your progress clock. Reveal your progress clock to the party and then tick it up to eight. Then how I was doing it was every round, 
And after they defeat an adversary, this is going to go down by one. So it's going to have a natural lowering. And there's only six here, but there's also an encounter rule. In here, you can see the Vengeance of the Veiling Counter move. Spend a fear to call forth two additional ancient skeletons and add two tokens to the action tracker. And then for your action tracker, I have an action token summon. Anytime your players take a move, summon the action token. To keep track of who has and who hasn't gone, right click on them, enter your combat state, and this is going to be where the initiative is. From there, click this. When they have gone, and they can go more than one time, but this just keeps track that like, if somebody says they don't want to go, keep track of that. Next round, it lights back up. Very simply, just like that. When it's all done, end combat. Yes. I needed to do some cleanup before this was all done, but oh well. It doesn't need to all be done right now. And that's going to be the basics of this. Once they defeat them, you can go here for the next description. As you go deliver a powerful blow, the ritual ends. And this is going to be the, the hook for the next quest. And while I don't have anything for the Spire just yet, this is your chance to homebrew. I'll be making my own mini campaign. And in, in addition, you can go to Beyond the Veil for congratulations. You did. You went through the playtest, and now I feel like you can say with confidence you are validated in order to make your own review of this game as a player, and in your case, as a game master as well. So, I hope you had a good time watching my video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, responses, or if you find any bugs, please let me know. This is going to be the last update until version 1.4 comes out. I'll be doing tweaks and making note of who and what is done to help, but overall, this has just been a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to playtesting this new mode.